Take God's Word this morning, open please to the book of 1 Peter, 1 Peter chapter 4 this morning. We're going to look at verses 13 down to verse 19. Would you stand for the reading of God's Word this morning? 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 13 is where we'll start. Actually, we'll back up to verse 12. Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened unto you. But rejoice inasmuch as you're partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad with, also with exceeding joy. And if ye be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye, for the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. And on, our, on their part he is evil spoken of, but on your part he is glorified. But let, you, let none of you suffer as a murderer, or as a thief, or as an evildoer, or as a busybody in other men's matters. Yet if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. <clears throat> For the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first begin at us, what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? And if the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? Wherefore, let them that suffer according to the will of God commit the keeping of their souls to him in well-doing as unto a faithful creator. Thank you. You may be seated. Pray with me. Father, we pray for guidance and direction from your word. Help us, Lord, to apply these truths to our life, and we pray in Jesus' name, amen. We've been looking at 1 Peter on Sunday morning, and if you've been with us, you know that Peter has been writing to believers who were going through a time of tremendous suffering. They've gone through what he calls a fiery trial. Now, when we go through trials, we have the tendency to think of those trials negatively. I mean, let's face it, no one likes to go through a trial. No one likes to go through difficulty. And so sometimes we have thoughts like, you know, God, why are you doing this to me? Why am I going through this? Why don't you send trials to my neighbor? He doesn't fear God. Why are you sending them to me? And so we have a tendency to view our trials as unwelcome strangers. And this was a tendency of the believers that Peter was writing to. They were looking at their trials in a very negative light. And what Peter's trying to do in this passage is to change their attitude Towards trials or to change their outlook because Peter knew that their outlook really would determine their outcome. When God gives us a trial, part of his purpose is that we may be made better through that trial. But just because you go through a trial, there's no guarantee that on the end of it you're going to get better. In fact, there are some that go through a trial and instead of getting better, they get bitter and they don't ever receive the true benefit of that trial. And in your spiritual life, if you go through a trial and you don't get the good from it, you know what God will do? He'll send you through another trial. Uh, One man wrote, one thing I've discovered from life is that until we learn the complete lesson from the crushing experience, we'll pass through it again at a different age under a different circumstance. So I don't want to have to repeat anything like that, any trials. I want to learn what I can. And, And Peter wants the people that he's writing to to benefit from the fiery trials that they're going through, so they can be fully blessed instead of simply being burned by the trial, that they'll be fully blessed because of it. And the test really when you go through a trial, when you think about it, it's internal. It's our mindset. It's our frame of mind. How will we meet this trial? How will we face it? So with that in mind, what Peter does here in this passage, he gives us four attitudes that we are to have when we go through a fiery trial, or we could say four responses to the fiery trial. And here's the first one, number one, if you're taking it, just write down, expect it. Number one, just expect it. Look again in verse 12. Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you. He calls them beloved. He's speaking warmly to them. Peter here has the heart of a pastor, but he also speaks firmly because what we see are just really six commands here. And this first thing where he says, think it not strange, this is what Greek scholars call a prohibition imperative. 
You know what that is? That's simply an action that commands something to stop that's already been happening. Already these believers were thinking that their trials were strangers. Why is this happening to me? They were thinking negatively about their trials, as if this shouldn't happen to me. I'm a Christian. Sometimes Christians think that way. The Bible says, look, if you're a child of God, you're going to experience trials. Jesus said it in John 16, He said, in the world ye shall have tribulation. As long as you're in this world and you're living for Christ, you're going to go through tribulation. Paul said in Acts 14, 22, we must through much tribulation enter into the kingdom of God. Some people think, well, now that I'm saved, I'm not going to, everything's going to be great. It'll be all roses and no thorns. I'm sorry, friend, that's just not true. Salvation doesn't erase trials. In fact, your Christianity may bring more trials because if you live in this ungodly world and you stand for the truth, you're going to be persecuted for it. You're, you're going in the opposite direction as the world, so you're meeting the world head on. And so you're going to go through trials. C.S. Lewis said, the real problem is not why some pious, humble, believing people suffer, but why some do not. And so trials are a part of the Christian life. In fact, go back to chapter 1 in 1 Peter. Look at verse number 6. He told us this already earlier. Look at chapter 1, verse 6. Wherein ye greatly rejoice, though now for a season. For a season. Trials are providential. God brings these seasons upon us. There are people here, and you're going through a trial. You're right now in the middle of a trial. Others, you're not in a trial, but it's coming. And some others, you've passed out of a trial. You just went through a time, a season of fiery trials in your life. But it's God who brings these seasons. It was Andrew Murray who wrote this. He said, when I go through a trial, I need to remember, first, he brought me here. Secondly, I need to remember, he will keep me by his love and by his grace. Third, he will make the trial a blessing to me and teach me lessons. And lastly, in his good time, he's going to bring me out of this trial. So he said, let me here say, I'm here by God's appointment, in his keeping, under his training, for his time. But they're providential. But secondly, they're purposeful because look again in verse number 6 where he says, wherein ye greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, implying there's a necessity here. You say, why do I have to go through trials? They're necessary. It's all part of God's training and discipline in your spiritual life. They need to be. Trials are like medicines that wound us and then make us better. They make us stronger. God has a divine purpose for it. But also trials are painful. Again, in verse number 6 where he says, Ye are in heaviness through manifold temptation. Lupeo, to be afflicted with sorrow. Trials bring sorrow, great sorrow. In fact, it's the sorrow that does the sanctifying work. If the trial doesn't bring sorrow, it does, it's no good. God uses sorrow as a tool to sanctify his people. Elizabeth Prentice was a mother who lost two children, and she was devastated by it, and she cast herself on the Lord. She later wrote a song, More Love to Thee, O Christ. We sing it in our church hymns, but there's a line in there that says, Let sorrow do its work. She understood the purpose of it. What was the work? To bring sanctification. Sorrow, the Bible says, is better than laughter, for by the sadness of the countenance, the heart is made better. And so trials are painful, but also trials are purposeful. We see again in verse 6 where he says that you're in heaviness through manifold temptations. And the word manifold means diverse. Uh, it means multicolored. The idea is that God will take a trial and he'll suit it for you. He'll, he'll pick, make a trial just for you that will fit you in your circumstance. It's personal. God is giving you this trial. Someone else may not have the exact same kind of trial as you have, but God is doing this. It's not an accident. It's because God is doing a work in you personally. So don't treat them as strangers, Peter said. Just expect it. This is part of the Christian life. This is what God does. But here's the second attitude, a second response. Embrace it. Go back to chapter 4. Look down at verse 13. He says, but rejoice. We expect trials to come. We don't treat them like strangers. But on the other hand, verse 13, rejoice.
and as much as you're partakers of Christ's suffering. Now here, Peter gives a strange command. When a fiery trial comes upon you, rejoice. Well, that's illogical, just quite frankly. It doesn't make sense to us, rejoice. You want me to rejoice when I'm hurting? You want me to rejoice when I've been crushed? You want me to rejoice when my heart has been broken? How can we do that? Think of Job. Remember the trials Job went through? He lost his health. He lost his wealth. He lost his children. How can he rejoice with that? What does Peter mean when he says that? You see, what he means is this. Our rejoicing is not connected to the pain of the trial because he just said we're going to have times of sorrow. You see, we don't rejoice in the pain. We rejoice in what it produces in our life. We don't rejoice in the pain. We rejoice in the product, not in the process that we're going through, but in what, in the end, it will bring in our life. That's the reason for rejoicing. What will trials bring? Well, purity. Look in verse number 12 again where he says, Think it not strange concerning the fiery trial. Look at that word fiery there. The Greek word there is purosis. You could almost hear the word purity in that word. And this is a word that's used to speak about a furnace that would melt metals to purge these metals of their impurities. And so the trial for the believer is a smelting furnace used by God to bring out the impurities of our life so God can skim them away. And he can develop us and sanctify us. Job said this, but he knows the way that I take. And when he has tried me, I shall come forth as gold. Job didn't rejoice in the pain he was going through, but he knew that in the end, God was going to bring him forth like gold. God was refining him. God was bringing about a purity in his life. Malachi 3.3 says this, and he shall sit as a a refiner and a purifier of silver. You know what a silversmith does when he purifies silver? He sits over the furnace. He's watching. He's seen the purities come to the top. He skims them off. He has his eye on the clock. He has his hand on the thermostat because he knows if he lets the silver go too long, he'll ruin it. And he knows when the silver is done, when he can look down and see his own image in the silver. And that's exactly what God does for us. You're going through a fiery trial? Well, God has you there, and his eyes on the clock, his hand is on the thermostat. He's skimming away the impurities of your life. He's not going to keep you there any longer than you need to be. And he's, he's gonna, he knows when the trial is over, when he can see his image in your life, the image of Christ. So it brings about purity. But here's the second thing. It brings about partnership. Look again in verse 12. Uh, verse 13, rather, but rejoice inasmuch as you are partakers of Christ's suffering. And that is when you go through a time of suffering and you're suffering because you're doing what's right, you're, 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 you're obeying the word of God, you are living for Christ and you go through suffering, well, you can rest assured Jesus is right there with you. There's a wonderful partnership. You become partakers of Christ's suffering in the sense that you're kind of suffering the same way he did during his earthly ministry. You understand Jesus, the Bible says, was a man of sorrows. And when he spoke truth, he suffered for it, and he bore our sins on the cross. And so Jesus was a man of suffering. And there's a sense in which you, when you follow Christ and you do what's right, and you're persecuted or you go through a season of suffering, you are joining Christ. You are partakers with Christ. There's a beautiful oneness and partnership that takes place. And you know what you experience? You experience the fellowship of Christ on a new level. There's a closeness. There's an intimacy that you have with Christ. Remember in the Old Testament, the three Hebrew children? King Nebuchadnezzar made a statue, an image, and told everyone to bow down, and the three Hebrew children said, we're not bowing. He said, I'm going to give you another chance. If you don't bow, I'm going to throw you into the furnace. And the response was, go ahead but we're not bowing. We might burn, but we're not going to bow. God's able to deliver us from the furnace, but if not, let it be known unto thee, O king, we're not going to worship your image. And the king said, okay. He got really mad. He turned the furnace up, the Bible says, seven times hot, which is illogical. Of course, when you get mad, you don't think straight, right? If he wanted him to suffer, he would have turned the furnace down, not up. 
But he throws them in, and then he looks in. You remember what he said? Didn't I throw three guys in there? How come there's four? And the, and the fourth looks like the Son of God. And then they, he called them out. They weren't burnt. They came out of the fire. The Bible says they came out of the fire without even the smell of smoke on them. I wish I could leave the barbershop that way. Without even the smell of the only thing that the fire burnt off of them is what the world put on them. And while they were in the fire, they had an incredible fellowship with Jesus Christ. Listen to this, Isaiah 43, verse 2. When thou passest through the waters, I will be with thee. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow thee. When thou walkest through the fire, thou shalt not be burnt, neither shall the flame kindle upon thee. When you go through the furnace, Jesus is with you, and you experience a new fellowship with Christ. And so there's purity that comes through the fiery trial. There's partnership that comes through the fiery trial. But then there's also praise that comes. Look again in verse 13. Look at the end where it says, that ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. Actually, let me back up a little bit. That when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. When is his glory going to be revealed? When Jesus comes again. And when he comes again, his, his glory will be on display. The first time he came, he came in humiliation. His glory was veiled, but this time when he comes, it'll be revealed. His glory will be revealed, and then you'll be filled with joy, Peter says. Why? Well, because you've been faithful, even through the trial, and then you will have praise. Again, in chapter 1, verse 7, he alludes to this. He said that the trial of your faith be much more precious than of gold that perishes though it be tried with fire, listen to this, might be found unto the praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus. When Jesus comes and you have been faithful, you will receive praise from him and honor from him and glory from him. There's always something in the heart of man that wants to receive praise and honor and glory. We don't want the praise of man. We want the praise of God. And Peter says, that's what you're going to get. And in verse 13 where he says, in, in as much as your partakers, that word there means in, in proportion to. In other words, the greater your suffering and your perseverance as you suffer, the greater the glory that you're going to have when Christ comes. And so there's purity, there's partnership, there's praise, but then here's another thing that happens when we go through the fiery trial, power. Look at verse 14. And if you be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye. The spirit of glory and of God rests on you. You're going through the fiery trial, and you're, you're remaining faithful to Christ. You know what happens? God's spirit and God's glory is resting on you. And he's talking to believers here. We all know that we all have the Holy Spirit, but there's a sense in which when you go through the fiery trial, there's something extra that you get. There's a power. There's a spirit of grace. There's a spirit of glory that comes upon you. You know what Peter's alluding to here? Remember in the Old Testament when the, the tabernacle, uh, and they were wandering through the wilderness, and they would set up the tabernacle, and the, and the glory of God would hover over it? What did that tell all of the, the Israelites who were camped around the tabernacle by tribes when they saw that glory hover over the tabernacle, what did they say? God's home, God's present. The spirit of glory hovered over that tabernacle. There's a sense of when, when you go through the fiery trial, there's a spirit of glory that hovers over you. God's with you. And there's power that he gives you. There's grace that he gives you. That's why Peter says, happy are ye or blessed are you. When that happens, uh, because this spirit comes to rest on you. What a privilege that you have this power and this measure in your life. This is what Paul said when God said, Paul, my grace is sufficient for you. I'll bring you through this, and I'll, I'll give you a portion of my grace that will bring you through the trial that you're dealing with. So that's why we embrace it. We don't embrace the pain but we do embrace the purity that comes in and the partnership 
and the praise from God and the power that we get from the Spirit of God. So when you go through the fiery trials, just expect it. It's part of the Christian life. Embrace it. But here's the third response. Evaluate it. Evaluate it. Look in verse 15 again where it says, but let none of you suffer as a murderer, as a judging America. I, I pray for our country. I pray for people in it. But I want to tell you something. When God begins to judge a nation, you know where he starts? He starts in the church. He starts in the house of God. Where did Peter get this from? Hold your place here and go to Ezekiel real quick. Let me just show you this. I think you should see it. Look in Ezekiel chapter 9. Let me just show you this. You could do a whole sermon on this, but let me give it to you really quick. In, in chapter 9, Ezekiel's in the middle of having a vision. Remember, Israel sinned against God. God's glory came across, off the nation. The whole spirit of glory, God left Israel. And that's what this vision is about. And after the glory of God left Israel, Ezekiel sees in this vision, look in chapter 9, look down in verse number 2, and behold, six men came from the way of the higher gate, which lieth toward the north, and every man a slaughter weapon in his hand. And one man among them was clothed with linen and with a writer's inkhorn by his side, and he went in and stood by the brazen altar. And the glory of the Lord of Israel was gone up from the cherub, whereon he was, and to the threshold of the house, and he called to the man clothed in the linen with the which had the writer's inkhorn by his side. And the Lord said unto him, Go through the midst of the city, through the midst of Jerusalem, and set a mark upon the foreheads of the men that sigh and that cry for all the abominations that are done in the midst thereof. And verse 5, And to the others he said in mine hearing, Go ye after him through the city, and smite, and let not your eyes spare, neither have ye pity. See what's happening here? God's glory is leaving. There are six men that are clothed in white linen, these are, these are angels. They have slaughter weapons in their hands. One has an inkhorn or an ink pen. God says to the one angel, look, with the inkhorn, you go throughout the city of Jerusalem, and anyone you see weeping and sighing over the sins, over the abominations of this nation, over this people, when you see them weeping, you put a mark on their forehead. And then he says to the rest of the guys with slaughter weapons in their hands, then you follow them. Anyone who doesn't have a mark, don't take pity on them. Judge them. This is a serious judgment from God on this nation for their idolatry, for their sins. And by the way, the word mark, just a little side note here, it's the, it's the Hebrew word tav. If, uh, it's the last letter of the Hebrew alphabet. And the Aramaic block script that we use now, it kind of looks like a cursive N with a dot in it. But that's not the Hebrew script that was used in Ezekiel's day. The Hebrew script that was used in Ezekiel's day, we call it now Paleo-Hebrew or Ancient Hebrew. You know what the Tav looked like in Ancient Hebrew? It was a cross. It was a cross. Think about that. Go through. Everyone you see weeping and sighing over the sins, put a cross on their head. It's interesting to me that thousands of years before the cross became a symbol of Christianity. God used that to say, these are genuinely my people. My people are the ones that weep and sigh over sin and the fact that I'm not being honored. And then, but here's the thing I want you to see. In verse 6, these guys are going to go through. He says, slay utterly old and young, both maids and little children and women, but come not near on, upon any man whom is the mark, the tav. Where do we start? Begin at my what? Start at my sanctuary and then work your way out. Start in my house. Because you would think the people that are there in my house, they're the most godly, and then work your way out. And that's where Peter gets his whole idea. Go back to 1 Peter chapter 4. Peter says, look, judgment is going to begin, but it always starts at the house of God. And then he says this in verse 17, and if it, if it first begin at us, what shall the end of them that obey not the gospel? What shall be the end of them that obey not the gospel? If God starts in his house, and if God's thorough in chastising his own people, do you, don't, do you not think he won't be thorough when it comes to judging the ungodly? Look at verse 18. And if the righteous scarcely be saved, what is the word scarcely there? Molas, with great difficulty. It refers to the difficulties that believers have to contend with through the fiery trials, through the hardship. 
If believers enter through the fires of purging and divine suffering, this God-ordained discipline, if God is thorough in purging his church, what do you think it's going to be like by the time he gets to the ungodly? Boy, it's going to be really hard on them. So sometimes when we go through the fiery trial, ready for this? God's purging his church. And when he gets out, outside his church, he really spares not in his judgment. But let me give you the last thing quickly. When you go through the fiery trial, expect it, embrace it, evaluate it. Is this because of my suffering? Is this just common suffering? Is this Christian suffering? Is God purging? Then here's the fourth thing, entrust it. Entrust it. Look at verse 19. Wherefore, let them that suffer according to the will of God commit the safekeeping of their souls to him and well-doing as unto a faithful creator. God says, entrust. Entrust it. The word entrust here, simply to deliver over for safekeeping, it's a banking term just to give as a deposit. You, you take your check, you deposit it in the bank. Why do you do that? Well, I mean, you trust the bank, obviously, right? Getting a little harder to do that. You, you just deposit it. It's in safekeeping. That's the idea here. Paul uses this word with Timothy. Timothy, I am the entrusting to you the gospel. You know, that's something that God has entrusted to us. That's an incredible thing when you think about that. When you hire a babysitter, you entrust the life of your child to the safekeeping of that person. And here God is saying to the believer going through the fiery trial, look, entrust your soul to the Creator. Now, if the Creator, can you think you can trust the Creator with your soul? I mean, the Creator, He is upholding all of His creation. Your soul is not a hard thing for Him to keep safe. And so Peter says, entrust your soul soul to a faithful creator. And if you think that's a hard thing to do, just remember Jesus, he did that same thing when he was unjustly persecuted, when he went to the cross, when he had to go through all of that unjust suffering. You know what the Bible says? Peter says this in 1 Peter chapter 2, if you go back, where it says, who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth, who when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but listen to this, but committed himself to him who judges righteously, same exact word. He entrusted himself to God. Here he was going through all of this suffering and persecution, and it was unjust. And what was Jesus' response? He simply entrusted his soul to the, to the Father. And that's what Peter says we need to do. When the fiery trial comes, and expect it, embrace it, evaluate it, entrust it. Those are the right responses. And you know what? God will help you. He will be with you, and he will bring about his purpose and plan in it. Let me just close with this. John Newton was the writer of Amazing Grace, and he watched his wife die of cancer slowly. That was a very hard thing for him. Anyone who's ever gone through that knows that. But in recounting those days, this is what John Newton said. Listen to what he said. I think it's so profound. He said, I believe it was about two or three months before her death when I was walking up and down the room offering disjointed prayers from a heart torn with distress that a thought suddenly struck me with unusual force to this effect. The promises of God must be true. Surely the Lord will help me if I'm willing to be helped. It occurred to me that we're often led to indulge that unprofitable grief, which is our duty, uh, which... Uh, which we are to resist to the utmost, uh, which both our duty and peace would require us to resist, I should say, to our utmost. And I instantly said, Lord, I am helpless indeed in myself, but I hope I am willing without reservation that thou should have helped me. You know what he's saying there? A lot of times when we go through trials and we go through the sorrow, there's something in us that wants to wallow in that sorrow wallow in the grief. And John Newton says, what we, it's our duty, peace requires, and our duty requires that we resist that urge. Because here's the thing, God will help you if you want help. If you want to indulge in the sorrow and in the grief, you're not asking God for help. But if you ask him, he will help you. Newton said, God's promises are true. 
And then he prayed and he said, Lord, I'm helpless, but I hope I am willing without reservation that you would help me. And friend, that's really in summary what Peter is saying here. God will help you through the fiery trial. Just ask him. He'll help you. Don't wallow in the sorrow. Don't treat trials like they're strangers. Expect it. Embrace it. God's Embrace the product of what he's doing. Evaluate it and trust it to God. God will help you. Let's bow for prayer together. How many here would say, right now I'm asking God for his help in my trial. I'm not going to wallow in the sorrow. I'm going to embrace the help of God. Would you lift your hands to the Lord? Everyone's heads bowed and eyes are closed. This is time between you and God. And that upraise hand, you're saying, God, help me in this. Help me in this. I ask for that help. The only you can give. God bless you. God bless you. If you're here today and you've never trusted Jesus as your Savior, let me just say, right now is the time. The Bible says, now is the accepted time. Now is the day of salvation. If you'll turn from your sin and turn to Christ and reach out to him in faith, he will save you. If you ask him, would you be willing to do that? Say, Lord Jesus, come into my heart, save me, make me your child, and he will save you. And that's the greatest decision you could ever make. And would you pray and ask God to do that? And if you've done that, would you let us know after the service? We're going to be here. You you come, and we want to help you start out in your new Christian life. And if you're a child of God and you just need some counsel, we'll be here right after the service. We'll help you. Father, bless these words to hearing hearts. We thank you for what you're doing. And we pray in Jesus' name, amen.